you don't have to. It's
Good evening, students, staff, and community members. Welcome to the second annual candidate forum sponsored by the Rho Kappa Social Studies Honor Society. My name is Avery Lindmark, and I will be moderating the forum tonight. Assisting me in asking questions this evening are Rho Kappa members Theo Diorio, Noel Urban, and Jay Hazi, and Andrew Harshberger, assisting with time shifting. We welcome the candidates this evening, Daryl Benneker, who is running for the Lake Country seat, and Craig Thompson, running for the at-large seat. Thank you for your time and willingness for participating in this forum. Kim Schubert, the Swallow Seat candidate, and Anne Angeli, the other at-large candidate, were not able to attend tonight. To ensure a positive and successful event, we have a few guidelines for audience members and candidates. We will begin by allowing the candidates to answer one introduction question they received in advance. Each candidate will have two minutes. The first speaker, Mr. Thompson, was chosen randomly, and Mr. Benneker will follow. The first person who speaks will be rotated. Candidates will also be allowed to make a two to three minute closing statement, which could be utilized to further clarify or expand on any of the answers in case they did not have sufficient time. The questions asked tonight were selected by a committee of students from those submitted by Arrowhead students. There will be two rounds of questions. The first round will consist of shorter questions with a one minute time limit, and the second round will consist of longer questions with a two minute time limit. The timekeeper will hold up a yellow card when 15 seconds remain, and a red card when time is up. The audience is reminded that the forum's purpose is informational and nonpartisan. The intent of the forum is not to support or oppose any candidates. We request that audience members be courteous and respectful of opinions that may differ from theirs. Please refrain from applause, as this will de decrease the amount of time candidates have to answer questions. Also, Arrowhead students will have the opportunity sub to submit questions anonymously with the QR codes at the signs at the front. There's one here on the back of the chair over there. One over here. Over there. Um, we will select a few questions submitted through the Google form to be answered by the candidates in addition to the pre-made list. While we encourage students to ask questions by scanning, the, by scanning the code, we also ask that everyone keeps personal devices silenced and put away as to not cause, cause distractions. Other audience members will not have an opportunity to ask questions during the forum, but may have an opportunity to chat with candidates informally after the event is complete. We will now begin with the introduction question, which was given to the candidates in advance with a two minute time limit. Beginning with Mr. Thompson, what inspired you to pursue a role on the school board and what do you plan to bring to the table that will benefit our students, teachers, and families? Well, thank you, Avery. Um, and first of all, I just wanna thank you and all the ROCAP folks, all the students and um, community members who have been here. Thank you, Daryl, fellow board colleague and friend for your participation. Um, your presence is a visible uh, testimony to your commitment and respect shown to these fine Arrowhead students who have prepared this forum. Uh, this may be a suitable moment to share a quote that I've seen in a number of places, but one place is the Harvard Business School, and it's something like this. 80% of success in life is just showing up. I can't help notice the absence of a few other candidates, including my, particularly my opponent. And it's uh, a missed opportunity for our students to meet each of the candidates, for the candidates to meet these students, and to participate together in this exercise in grassroots democracy. What better way for Arrowhead students to learn positive involvement in our form and process of government than by observing adult role models in person and interacting with them. Again, thank you, Will Kappa. What inspired me? Well, I have a dad who was a school board member some uh, many years ago. And uh, I don't think I ever had that actually consciously in the back of my mind, but I have a dad. I was a teacher myself for a few years right out of college. My wife, uh, Amy, uh, was a teacher for five years. And my father-in-law, obviously my wife's father, uh, his name is John Boy, and he was the principal of Brookfield Central High School for many years. So I have some role models myself. But as to why I'm running for the board, um, as the current Arrowhead School Board's longest serving member, uh, I bring a conservative perspective that focuses on kids. The Arrowhead Board needs experience, stability, integrity, and in institutional knowledge. Wow, that time went fast. Um, with nearly 19 years on the board, I can provide what several in, our first, in their first term on the board cannot. My opponent would add to the inexperience. At this time, civility and efforts toward building mutual respect 
in the context of a nonpartisan effort to govern are especially important. I re represent the entire Arrowhead community without partisanship and respect the longstanding tradition of excellence at this school. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, and on to Mr. Benneker. What inspired you to pursue a role on the school board, and what do you plan to bring to the table that will benefit our students, teachers, and families? Good evening, everyone. My name. Can you guys see? Good evening, everyone. My name is Daryl Benneker, and I've been serving on the Arrowhead School Board for six years now, and I'm seeking re-election for another three years. I have four children. I have a 2021 graduate that's attending UW Madison right now, a senior in high school, a junior in high school, and I'll, my youngest will be attending Arrowhead this fall. So first and foremost, I want to just express my deep gratitude for the opportunity to participate in this forum to discuss the future of our school. The responsibility of serving on the school board is one that I do not take lightly at all. It is a duty that requires dedication, compassion, and genuine commitment from every student, for every student. Inspiration, I have four of them. They're my four kids. Um, I have a vested interest in making sure my parent voice is heard when it comes to decision impacting my kid's future. Um, never really thought of it, of doing it. But I did have the wake up call when we, I was living in Oconomowoc at the time. We were touring schools for my daughter Allie for kindergarten and we, we were in district at summer school. And the place was busting out at the seams. Um, this is before they built their middle school, but I was seeing makeshift classrooms in the hallway with um, with um, cubicles there. It was just chaos. And that was just kind of a wake up call for me of that, you know, taking a really a vested interest in ownership of my kid's education. And when my, you know, with it, you know, we I investigated many options for enrollment and decided that Arrowhead was the, um, the best fit. As far as what, oh, okay. As a candidate that I bring to the table is the passion for education, the future vision of the community. Um, I also bring a wealth of expertise and experience to the table um, where I've worked um, at, as a teaching assistant at the University of Memphis, an adjunct professor at Cardinal Stritch, and I also worked for market research for over 25 years where my main job is listening. Listening to the audience, listening to the customers, and I feel that's what we need to do, what I need to do, or any successful board member needs to do before making decisions here representing the Arrowhead community. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Hi everyone, I'm Noelle Urban. And so now we will move on to the short answer questions with one minute time limit, time limit each. All right. Considering the increased use of artificial intelligence in education, how can the school integrate AI as a tool in our classrooms, as well as mitigate any potential plagiarism or cheating? We will start with Mr. Benneker first. Okay, in terms of AI, I'm a believer, it's awesome. It's awesome to have, and I think with technology, we need to embrace it. Back in my day, you know, I was the first one to use a computer for a typewriter, for typing. It was considered cheating. It's like, oh, you could do backspace, but you need to embrace the technology. Same thing with the internet. In today's, it's happening with AI. In terms of with plagiarism and cheating, I think that's one of the things that we need to, um, I know our administration is looking at that and just trying to find the solutions, but I feel we need to embrace the AI, but it is what's those guidelines to for education. That's my point of view on it. All right, to Mr. Thompson, I'll repeat the question. Considering the increased use of artificial intelligence in education, how can the school integrate AI as a tool in our classrooms, as well as mitigate any potential plagiarism or cheating? That's a challenging question. As uh, Mr. Benneker also me already mentioned, uh, the administration is very aware of this as a problem for uh, potential plagiarism and cheating. Uh, 
stepping back a little bit more, I know that uh, technology will advance whether we like it or not. Uh, it always does, and we are going to have to learn as we go, I think, to cope with the challenges that uh, confront us with it. Um, there's always an upside and a downside to any, any technology. And the upside can be to help make our lives better and smoother and uh, uh, make things go faster, but uh, there's also obviously a downside. So I'm not an expert at that, but I, I sure would like to learn. All right, thank you for that. We'll move on. Given recent concerns about arrowhead scoring in reading sections, what is your plan to improve our school's standardized test performance? We'll go to Mr. Thompson. Well, I know that we've been working on a board, as a board and as an administration on this for some time now, uh, at least a year or two. Um, some of the scores are not up to Arrowhead standards, and that needs to change. Uh, there's no doubt of that. Um, there have been um, usage of uh, technology uh, to help students individualize their instruction in terms of uh, uh, extra readings and readings to supplement um, other classroom instruction. And I know that every administrator, every teacher is full on board with um, getting reading as a, as a focus into every classroom, not just the English classrooms, and not just the foreign language classrooms, but even science and math. Uh, reading is part of a focus now, so that's very important. All right, thank you, and we'll go to Mr. Benneker. Thank you. Um, we're already making um, changes. I see two things that are happening that are positive. The first thing is Craig and I, you know, along with the other seven board members, sit on committees. One of them is curriculum, where we are looking at this hard, and I think we're implementing English 11 into the curriculum there so to give you know more focus on helping improving those um, reading scores i also think the block scheduling will be a benefit too which will be kicking in this fall where it will allow teachers empower them to have deeper learning teaching and understanding so i think just with those two things right there coming into place we'll um, see um, improvements in the reading scores in the long run Age of constantly changing technology, what role do personal devices have in the classroom, and to what extent should phone use be regulated? Mr. Becker. Um, in terms of phones, like I said with technology, I'm your biggest advocate for technology. Embrace it, don't fight it. Um, with this phone here, one of the things is for us, for our graduates here, is set them up for success in the future. I can't tell you the number of times I'm listening to it a presentation at work, instead of jotting notes down, I'm just thinking of my high school, where I'm jotting notes down, I'm not really listening, I'm just copying everything, not comprehending. What I do, I take the picture of it, listen to the teacher. I feel that's one of the things that we need to, in terms of embracing the technology. Um, you know, in terms of the f use of phone regulated, I think, you know, it's really up to the teacher of what we can and cannot do. There are some things that you need to embrace it. I mean, I know my daughter in physics class, she used the rulers like, okay, she didn't have a ruler, she used the ruler app to measure things. We need to embrace the technology because it is going to be a continued challenge and colleges will expect people to use the technology moving forward and also in the professional area. Thank you. Mr. Thompson? Yeah, once again, um, technology will, will advance whether we like it or not. It is going to happen, and so in one respect, we have to embrace it. Um, at Arrowhead here, some many months ago, maybe a year or more, um, quite a number, of, we were made aware as a board that quite a number of teachers actually wanted uh, phones, phone usage limited. And so uh, I am generally a person who listens very carefully to what the administration and teachers say. And if they think that uh, devices uh, are being, uh, are more of a distraction than a help, then we need to do something about that. So there have been many different ways to uh, approach this. Some schools, you know, you gotta check your phone at the front door. 
other schools we have little uh, caddies in each room and you check it in when, when you uh, uh, walk in the door of the classroom, which is what we're doing here more. Um, I think that idea is important and helpful. It's all about not being a distraction in the classroom and being instead a device that can help. And as Daryl said, if it can help, let's use it. If it's a distraction, let's put it aside. Thank you. Wisconsin Statute 118.33e allows the required number of PE semesters to de <coughs> decrease from three to two if students are in a varsity sport. Would you support such a policy as advocated by AHS athletes? Mr. Thompson. Um, we've had several go-arounds uh, in my time on this topic, not with a statute change, but just as the concept. Um, there are pros and cons. Uh, some people will claim my kid, uh, excuse me, my student, my student athlete is uh, out for football, okay, or basketball, or soccer, or golf, or whatever it may be, um, and therefore they shouldn't have to take uh, as much PE. Yes, but um, what if your student athlete is one of the hundred or more on the football team and most of them never get into play? Um, or what if you, um, you know, maybe a golfer doesn't has as much physical exertion as a swimmer or a wrestler? Um, there are a lot of things to consider here. A broader um, knowledge of a physical uh, ed education is also helpful for everyone's future. Not just knowing one sport, but, but knowing um, many physical activities to go in your future. This also touches, and I see I'm out of time, but it touches on budget, because if we allow uh, fewer physical education classes, we can cut a, cut a teacher, right? But is that the best thing? There are all kinds of factors involved in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Benneker? I would be in favor of cutting it from three down to two, as long as that st student athlete is in good standing and is, you know, it's signed off by the coach of you know, playing sportsmanship, et cetera. Um, I just feel you know, there is so much to learn when you're in a varsity sport. There is great learning experience. And also just with students and more pressures today of taking more classes or um, <clears throat> you know, especially with you know, different requirements. I mean, we're requiring the personal finance, which I'm a huge believer in. Um, but there are some trade-offs there, and if it, I'm in favor of going from, from three down to two, as long as that athlete's in good standing, regardless of not playing or playing, as long as they're take, doing the time and practice, I feel that's something that we can, should be wavered. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Hazi. I'm a senior here at Arrowhead. Um, my first question is, how can we collaborate with feeder schools to prepare and transition incoming ninth graders to navigate the challenges of high school effectively? Mr. Benninger, you're first. Well, I think some of the work is already being done. Um, I think it's, you know, just the communication. I know Sue Cassetta, our director of learning, um, does have um, conversations with the feeder schools in the junior high level in terms of making that smooth transition. Um, that I think it's, you know, again, just communication, setting the expectations of, um, for those um, students. All right, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, um, this is not a new uh, issue. We've been working on a, a tr eight, nine transition for quite a long time as long as I can remember. So um, we, I know that the administration and certain teachers in the various departments, maybe heads of various departments, math, uh, social sciences, uh, science, um, do interact with the feeder school uh, people. Uh, that's been happening for a long time. It's very valuable, especially valuable, of course, in a uh, district like ours, we're not a K-8, I mean, we're not a K-12. So uh, that's, that's important. Uh, the administration and the board has long been aware of this. We've long been working on it, and, and we will continue to work on it. Other than that, once you get kind of get right, the very first thing that incoming freshmen do when they come here is um, you get in, uh, are, they are uh, welcomed in with the uh, a 
celebration the first few days before school. And um, that is a really wonderful way for kids to become a part of uh, the school uh, and the school's activities. The name of the, the, name of the uh, Wings. Wings, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Wings program is, has been going on for six or eight years now, and it's a great program. Next question, how can we improve access to mental, mental health resources in schools to better support students' emotional well-being and academic success? Mr. Thompson, you're first. Um, well, first of all, let me give a shout out to our um, student services uh, department. They're fine people. I respect them a great deal. Um, they're always there in terms of counseling and being there for students who need it. Um, if we had a budget to hire uh, half a dozen more uh, student services folks and counselors, I would be happy to do that. Kids are under tremendous pressure these days, um, unlike ever before. And so um, we, I guess we need to simply make it more well known perhaps to some students. I, I hope that they would be aware of that. Um, I, hope, I, I think all of us in our high school experiences had a special teacher here or there who took us under their wing and made a very big difference for us. And I think anything we can do to encourage teachers to take a student under their wing, uh, that's better. I don't have time to get distracted, get into a longer discussion about this, but I have voted to support uh, uh, teachers being able to be more active in the lives of the kids. Others have not. Thank you. Mr. Benneker? In terms of um, mental health, it is a growing concern for all students. And I think it's, you know, I think we have a, you know, a great support staff on board and have been, you know, phenomenal of helping our students. But sometimes they may need that um, extra push of, um, where virtual care has been a huge thing, um, a huge asset. And I think if we had like dedicated areas, so if there is our students that see a counselor, you know, if it's through Children's Hospital or other health system, having that access to a room of doing that virtual care would be a huge um, gateway to for success for that to happen. And then also, you know, in terms of I think it's also, you know, next year we'll have the resource period, which can be used in many different ways. And, you know, in terms of, you know, being student support services, being there for more for students, you know, that's something to look at. You know, not just help with classroom things, but also mental health. I think that could be a big win. Thank you both for those responses. Now for a very controversial question, Barbie or Oppenheimer? <laughs> is there a choice C? <laughs> no, Mr. Redeker first. Uh, I hate to say it, I haven't seen either one, but I could see myself seeing Oppenheimer. I just need that five hours set aside to watch the show. <laughs> okay, Mr. Thompson. Oh, wow, eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Uh, no, seriously, I am an Oppenheimer kind of guy. Uh, I have a great deal of interest in um, uh, history and particularly in the history of World War II. And so I know that Mr. Oppenheimer <laughs> had a profound impact on the outcome of World War II. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, that movie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, to continue. What are your opinions on the newly introduced block schedules and how they will be implemented? Mr. Thompson first. Well, I'll say that initially I was a little bit uh, um, reluctant and hesitant to adopt the uh, block schedule. But uh, as I try to make my practice, um, I listen to the administration and uh, listen to Mrs. Cassetta in particular and the other uh, uh, administration who very, very, uh, over some length of time, um, 
gave us good information, factual information, data from many other schools uh, that uh, indicated that the block schedule would be very uh, helpful to our students. Um, so gradually I came around and, uh, would, and am in favor of it. Um, along with what uh, Mr. Benneker mentioned, a key element of that is the resource period. There will be a half an hour at the beginning of each day whereby kids can use that time to, for all manner of different needs, whether it be catching up with their homework, uh, seeing a teacher, doing a lab that they missed, uh, mental health reasons, uh, whatever it is. So I think that will be helpful. And uh, there has also been a great deal of focus and will be further focus on um, uh, professional development for teachers to um, adapt to this and to improve their current practice if they haven't been doing it already. Thank you. Mr. Benneker? My opinion, along with Craig, I was resistant and I did um, vote against it when it first came to vote. Um, but after that, I did learn, or did have some listening sessions with um, administration and also department leads. One of my big things is basically block scheduling. I think someone said 42% of the classes have it today. There's some where I was like, okay, how does this work for math? How does this work for world language? I'm not sold on it. And it did help me having those conversations with the teacher of it's like, okay, 84 minutes. I mean, me professionally, I have a hard enough keeping attention for 60 minutes. So how do you have a student do 84 minutes times four? But the way um, Mr. Kurtz um, has used it before, it's like we're chunking that 84 minutes into three different areas where it's basically I'm lecturing, there's work assignments, you know, during that time, and then at the end it's like, okay, let's recap and, you know, kind of tie up the lesson plan. So um, I'm very confident and excited with block scheduling here. But it is one of those things that it took team collaboration to kind of figure out how this works to get, you know, people behind it. Thank you for your answers. Mm -hmm. How can the district continue to support students who are academically struggling or at risk of dropping out? I think it's just, you know, the communication academically struggling. You know, I think the resource period, again, I hate to, you know, this is probably my third time mentioning it. This is a pivotal area to help with those academically struggling. Um, I think it's, you know, just the constant communication with, you know, the teacher and student. If it is, you know, again, using the um, resource period or a study hall of getting those kids up to speed. And then also at the risk of dropping out, I think it's just, you know, sometimes some of them may catch you by surprise, but I think it's just constant communication that the teacher or the, um, the counselor that's assigned to um, the student, just seeing what where things are at and just making sure that they're at a good spot. And you know, the last thing anyone wants is a high school kid to drop out of uh, high school and move on, so. Mr. Thompson? Um, yeah, speaking to what, what uh, Mr. Benninger just mentioned, uh, thankfully, uh, our district for now and for many, many years in the past has a very, very low dropout rate. That's something to be proud of. However, there are always kids that have trouble. And I think it has to be a team approach. We have uh, very many caring teachers in our school. We have a wonderful administration and student services uh, group. Uh, but we also must uh, include, as I, I know our teachers do, the parents in any, anything like this. Parents, it's parents, teachers, counselors, um, and students. So it's a team and we work together and we try to keep communication lines open and keep kids motivated and try as hard as they can. Thank you. Vaping has continued to be a concern on campus. How do you plan to address it through reinforcement or education? Mr. Thompson. Uh, I know we've talked about this at board meetings. Uh, there's vaping on campus. There's vaping uh, not, not outside the building, inside the building, in the restrooms. I know that we've put, uh, I think, some sensors in the bathrooms to, to detect whether there's any vaping going on there. 
Um, education is an important part of it, of course. Um, vaping is harmful for kids. It's harmful for their lungs, it's harmful for their uh, bodies, it's harmful for their minds. Uh, so education to, for kids to know that is very, very important. So it's, it's a multi-pronged approach, uh, trying to detect and limit uh, and restrict, as well as help, pe help young people know uh, what's in their own best interest. Thank you. Mr. Becker? I think we need to start earlier than high school, quite honestly. I mean, I have three kids that have gone through high school, and you know, I've heard the stories about the vaping in junior high. Um, it's getting out of hand. It is, you know, very harmful. harmful you know, echoing um, Craig's responses here, but I think it's educating them on it and pretty much having, you know, kind of putting the hammer down of if you get caught for vaping, there are consequences. Making the children accountable. What the, what extent that is, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think you know, it's it's not getting better. It's getting worse, and it's getting younger. So again, I think it's starting at the feeder schools, quite honestly, and keep that level of accountability into the high schools. Thank you. Common complaints from students include the failure to improve the pool, leaking ceilings, soccer fields, and traffic problems. How will you go about increasing public favorability towards education funding to address these kinds of issues that have a negative impact on students? Mr. Bedecker. Okay, we're going to need more than a <laughs> on this. Um, I think it's, you know, in terms of um, improving it, I mean, looking at the pool, it is 50 plus years old. I mean, we've done, I think our Buildings and Grounds group has done an excellent job of keeping it together with the pool, but it is a problem. Um, in terms of, you know, our big thing is, you know, getting referendums passed or, you know, to help with a few of these problems. Um, you know, the traffic problems, that is a huge concern of, of mine because I've witnessed morning drop-offs here. It is a logistics nightmare. So um, we just need, I wish I had a straightforward answer here. I mean, basically, we need money to fix the pools, fix the traffic problems. And our board has been doing been making a concerted effort of looking at referendum solutions for this. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, um, we've had on multiple occasions our state representatives in our school. I have met with a state representative uh, over a cup of coffee on a, at a table. Um, uh, we've done this several times, and we explain our financial problems. Uh, we take them on tours through the building, we show them, you know, the bucket, you know, from the leaky roof. Um, and they look at that and all, and I'm sorry, I'm a little bit peeved at this. They shrug their shoulders and say, well, go to a referendum. Oh, well, that's great. But I'm sorry that I believe that the state of Wisconsin, even written in the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin, has an obligation to fund our schools, and I think they have to fund them properly and they've not been doing that. So what we will be doing is going to a ref referendum in November, and uh, I think we have another question on that coming up soon, but um, here this evening, but uh, it all takes money, and we don't have it. We don't have the money. All right, next question. How would you prioritize funding among the different departments at Arrowhead, among STEM, fine arts, language arts, and other disciplines? Mr. Thompson. This is a catch-22 question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you do that. I mean, there are, there are kids who excel and need STEM. There are kids that excel in and need fine arts and language arts and sports and science. And you can't just say, well, we're just going to cut one of these things. It can't be done. You, you, I don't know how you can prioritize among those things, quite frankly. Um, they're all extremely important, and we can't do without them. So um, maybe that's what I meant by a catch-22 uh, question. I'm not blaming you. 
uh, Jane. Um, but um, we just have to do the best we can with all the programs that we have. Thank you. Mr. Benneker? Yes, this is a difficult question to answer because there is all needs. I mean, you basically prioritizing, you just kind of look at which ones are greater demand of the students, and that's where the route you may take. But it is a challenge of funding these. You know, if it's through our school budget or, you know, if there's, you know, fundraisers that we can do to help um, with the cause. I know just I'm amazed by the technology education um, area that's led by uh, Mr. Christensen, where he has like companies that come and donate, you know, very expensive pieces of equipment. He does a great job of getting that community involved, bringing them in, doing tours of the school or of his department and getting that community engaged. He does a phenomenal job in that way. I mean, I wish in his is, you know, it's an easy fit. I just wish we could do something for each of these areas. Again, it's hard to prioritize in funding when our funding is smaller than what we hope for. Thank you both for those responses. All right, for our last question for this round. Many students have expressed problems with accessing everyday online resources and experience more lag in different areas of the building due to unreliable Wi-Fi connectivity. Do you support further investments in upgrading our Wi-Fi infrastructure for our students and staff? Mr. Benneker. Oh yes, definitely. Um, in terms of, I do, you know, wish we can do those further investments. And I'm sure, like, when we're, you know, building out that wish list of the referendum of, you know, it's not just building, but Wi-Fi is in that mix but definitely i mean the wi-fi you know in here it is it is a challenge a huge uh, challenge mr thompson yeah i think probably both of us are going to start sounding like a broken record but it, it it comes down to money and we need money to do all these things and we simply don't have enough certainly i support further um, development and connectivity of Wi-Fi. It's, it's a critical piece of student learning in this day and age. There's no doubt of it. Um, but can we do everything we want to do? That's, that's the problem, and we can't. Um, so we have upgraded in the past few years, uh, but these things always need to be upgraded more because technology changes. We understand that. Um, but it's uh, not easy to do if you have a whatever hundred thousand dollar problem in front of you and you have to decide where's it, where's that money going to be spent thank you for those answers this completes round one we will now move on to two questions that were submitted by the audience with a one minute time limit With new changes in the scheduling for the 2024 to 2025 school year, do you see a possibility for later school and start and end times? Mr. Thompson. Um, as we talked about the block scheduling and the move to block scheduling, there really was no discussion uh, of any substance uh, about changing the start and end times. Um, Quite a few years ago, uh, I think it was when Mr. Lotus was still superintendent, that goes back a ways. Um, but we instituted uh, 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 you know, early and late uh, uh, flexible scheduling options. Um, that was done you know, 16, 17 years ago, 18 years ago. And so that is a, uh, has been a very valuable piece of uh, students scheduling as long as they meet the requirements. Is to have a, I think it's a B plus average and um, be responsible in terms of getting uh, to and from school uh, at a proper time. But no, in terms of the new changes, no, I don't believe we've had any substantive discussion of that. Thank you. Mr. Benneker? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't see that happening, um, especially you know with bus schedules. Um, for busing, there's kind of like a rotation of we're shared amongst Arrowhead and the feeder school. So we're the first route. Then it's like 
one set of feeder schools like Lake Country and Swallow or Stone Bank, after people get dropped off at Arrowhead, they pick up those students, then other school districts are being picked up there. So, I mean, the main thing with bus schedule, I know, you know, it's a challenge that um, of changing schedules to starting later. Thank you. With the board term lasting three years, what specific goals will you work on to accomplish by 2027? Mr. Benneker. Things that we want to accomplish, I mean, there's a couple things, you know, just improving our scores. Um, Conrad Farner, our new superintendent, you know, he's, um, I'm very impressed with him and, you know, his, you know, less than one year here. And um, Mr. Kurth and the team, I think it is, you know, we said improving reading scores, improving scores overall to um, make us, you know, continue to make us a top-notch school. That's the one thing. Funding is another thing, you know, through referendum, um, we're hoping to get, you know, additional money there. I wish, you know, the annual budget of state funding, hopefully that would be the ultimate wish of being, revisiting that and having that be more um, on a realistic level, you know, playing ground rather than using what was determined back in 1993. So again, scores and funding are the specific goals. Thank you. Mr. Thompson? Well, the uh, current uh, probably biggest priority is a referendum and trying to get a referendum passed in November. Uh, our school desperately needs uh, additional funding. It needs uh, has serious uh, maintenance issues and so forth, old facilities. So that's the first thing. Uh, academically, we do have uh, some scores in the reading area in particular that are lower than uh, what, what should be here at our school and a school of our uh, caliber. So uh, we are already begin, have already begun that and we will continue to do so. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, something's come up again and again at board meetings is uh, the issue of bullying in our school. I think that is a problem and it's not, however, a problem that has gone unaddressed. I don't want to imply that it has not been addressed, it has been. But it's an ongoing problem and it's an ongoing issue that we need to continue to focus on. Um, and then for my part, um, on the board itself and among the board, uh, I think it's very important to increase the level of uh, collaboration, uh, civility, uh, courtesy with one another and respect for one another. Thank you. Thank you. That completes round two. We will now move on to our final round, which consists of questions with two minute time limits. How do you see the role of students, parents, and the community in shaping education policy? Mr. Thompson first. Uh, when we hired our superintendent, uh, our new superintendent, uh, about a year ago, over a year ago, um, there were several in the running, and um, one uh, <coughs> candidate for superintendent of, of Arrowhead High School uh, was uh, rather dismissive of students, and that meant that she was, excuse me, that person was rather uh, dismissed by our board because um, we want to listen to the students, and that's why I'm here. Parents are obviously the most important partners of the students and need to be uh, listened to as well. I remember a few years ago, I was uh, just attending a basketball game uh, at school here and uh, the, the uh, ticket taker uh, was um, Mr. Anthony, who had been my daughter's um, AP Chem teacher. And we had exchanged some pleasantries, and then I said to him, you know, I'm so appreciative of what you did to help my daughter get through that really tough class. And he said, it's the parents. It's the parents together with the teachers who make, who create success. And I believe that. Um, 
So, in the community, of course, uh, that's why we have things like this. It's a little bit disappointing sometimes that more people don't come up and that more people don't show up at board meetings even. Um, but we try. And so, uh, I think we continue to try to reach out, to respond to uh, emails or phone calls or whatever we get uh, as uh, promptly and as thoroughly and respectfully as we can uh, from community members, um, parents, and so forth. All right, Mr. Benneker. Yeah, I see all three of them playing an important role, and um, I think it is just you know the communication too of you know talking to board members or talking to the administration and staff of you know in terms of you know in terms of shaping the education policy. I think it's you know just us continuing to look at where we can get better, and also you know just kind of finding those resources of how we can improve the education amongst our, our students. Um, but again, yeah, I think it's, you know, the big thing is, you know, listening, just see, you know, looking at things of keeping, moving forward on things. All right, thank you. What do you see as the Arrowhead's biggest challenges and how would you address them, Mr. Becker? The biggest challenge is I know it's a broken record is funding it is that is the biggest challenge when you have money in your budget there's a lot of great things that you can do and I see you know if with you know if we don't pass the referendum you know Arrowhead is in a unique situation we're on our own district district for grades 9 through 12 we're like one of maybe a dozen throughout the state. So trying to pass a referendum, you know, when you have a K through 12 school district, it's easier because you have more kids, parents that are in that district, you know, more extended family. That is a big challenge for us. And I feel that is one of the things that if, you know, down the road, if we don't pass a referendum here at Arrowhead, I feel that is something that we need to maybe revisit of do we need to look and see, does it make sense to be a K through 12 district? You don't see many people going from K through 12 and just going nine through 12. You know, there is, you know, sometimes, you know, consolidations of that. Um, but again, it is funding and that's one of the things that I think we just, because there is a lot of referendums out there, a lot of referendum ask, and especially for myself as a resident of Lake Country, I have a referendum, you know, our community, it's going to be asked to pass a referendum for a total of $15 million. On average homeowner, that is about, uh, I think it's $700 increase on your property taxes. In November, in North Lake is kind of in the same boat. In November, Arrowhead potentially, more likely will be asking referendum too. So I'm hearing more and more the term of tax tolerance of you know community and that's one of the things that we kind of really need to look at of you know in terms of getting the funding that we need to thank you mr thompson well once again it is a bit of a broken record but um uh, just to give a little context some folks may know or may not know but um there was uh, a law passed by the state of wisconsin in 1993 1993 it was supposed to uh, um, provide for a funding model for, for our schools. And whatever level you were funded at as a school at that time, over 30 years ago, that was the level you were frozen at going forward. Now, it was supposed to be a temporary model uh, to last for a year or two until they were able, the legislature was supposed to be able to get their act together and do something more permanent. Well, it's been permanent, all right. It's been 30 years. So for example, um, Brook, uh, the Elbrook schools, um, on average, get about, I hope I'm exactly right on this number, something like $15 million a year more than Arrowhead High School gets. Now, how do you compete? Why? Because they were spending at a higher level back then than we were. Board, even back then, even before, way before my time, was was a very conservative, frugal board, 
and they tried to keep expenses down. Well, we've, we've gotten punished for that for the last 30 years, and those costs add up. So uh, one thing we've tried to do is focus some more attention on the legislative process. We've made a little bit of progress in that regard, in that the funding level for all schools was raised a, a bit more than it has been in the past um, this last year, in this uh, last uh, state biennium budget. Um, but it's not nearly enough. So um, sometimes people will say, well, why don't you just run your school like you run business? Well, businesses can increase their revenues. Schools cannot. We have a cap on our revenues imposed by the state of Wisconsin that we can't change. So it makes it, it puts us in a hard place. Expenses go up by inflation and more. Our revenues have stayed uh, not level, but darn close and not nearly enough to keep up with inflation. So it's a funding issue. That's, a, that's our biggest challenge. And whether that's met by the changing the state's attitude or by a referendum, uh, that's one of the other of those choices have to be made. Both one or the other or both of them. Thank you. What role should the school board play in moderating classroom signage and course content? Mr. Thompson. Oh, goody. Um, <laughs> philosophically, um, I place a great deal of respect and trust in the educational professionals who are at this school. This is near and dear to my heart. Um, Those folks, under the auspices, under the authority, certainly of the board, the board is the authority over everything that goes on in this school in one way or another. But if we are so foolish as to not respect the uh, expertise and the knowledge and the experience of our uh, fine staff, then we're being foolish. Whether that has to do with signage or course content or not. We had a brief content, uh, uh, brief discussion of this over uh, at the last school board meeting and there was some touching about course content and textbook selections and so forth. <clears throat> yes, we should have the ultimate final say, but um, it appeared that the discussion at the, at the last board meeting was starting to go towards uh, the school board saying yay, on, yay or nay on every, every textbook and I thought, wait a minute, that, that's not the way we do things around here. If you think that I'm going to have a proper ability to say yay or nay on this uh, calculus, advanced calculus textbook, or the French book, or the AP psych book, or I mean, you could, the list is as long as you're on. I am not gonna be put in a position where I say, yeah, that's a good book, no, that's not a good book. So the hard thing about these often is it's, it's viewed by some as black and white. None of these things are black and white. There are, there's much gray in between, and we have to be able to talk to each other and reason with, with each other and listen, as uh, my colleague Daryl started uh, at the very beginning. We need to listen and learn and come up with a reasonable conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benneker. And in terms of the role of play of the school board in moderating classroom and course content, I think it, our role is listen to, you know, we have to listen to all facets of, you know, the students, the teachers, the community, et cetera, on this. You know, in terms of course content, I tap into the experts of that. So, um, you know, in terms of world language, I'm not that expert, but it is one of those things of, okay, you know, just seeing what they have out there. And it is, for us as a board, it's maybe asking questions. You know, especially it's like, okay, if we see test scores dip down in English or something, you know, administrators were probably doing the same thing of like okay you know what questions we we're asking of you know how can we make it that content better you know is there something that we should be doing i think you know our role you know is listening we are the ultimate decision makers but i think it is collecting the information from all facets and also listening to experts in each of those areas
the next question. Given the increased prevalence of social media in the daily lives of teenagers, how do you plan to address cyberbullying in schools? Mr. Benneker. Okay. Um, well, it is, you know, cyberbullying, and I think it's the fine line where, you know, as administr you know, administrators, teachers, you know, there's so much we can do in school. But it's also educating, you know, our Arrowhead has these students for, you know, seven, eight hours a day. We don't have them for the other 16 hours a day. So it is educating, you know, parents about, you know, the social media of what we can control that. But I know in terms of addressing cyberbullying in schools, I think it is one of those things of, you know, especially, you know, it's just educating the students. And one of the things that I feel the cyberbullying, in my opinion, 90% of them are, are fine. It's the 10% that maybe that are causing the more harm in it. Um, I think it is, you know, just kind of when things come up, when people see it, I think there is, you know, just we may need to um, enforce stiffer penalties on it, make kids accountable for it. I don't know what exactly what that penalty is, but that's stuff that I think it's working with administration and the board and get input from teachers of what we can do to address this. But again, you know, there's so much that we can do in with kids in school here, but it is, you know, there is a lot of um, responsibility for the parents too. And it is one of those things that, you know, with cell phones, we see that it's, you know, if people are abusing it, you know, teachers do take them away, you know, and have the kid, you know, pick them up at the end of the day, or they do sit in, in the school office too, of ones that are abusing that, and maybe it's enforcing them more. But I think accountability is the hugest thing of, you know, to pay for the consequences, because it's horrible. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, yeah, this, this ties into cyberbullying is, <clears throat> you know, it's bullying, bullying is bullying. Um, you can control bullying in the school a little bit more, uh, in the hallways and kids call a name and so forth. Uh, there's a little bit of better control there, but as Mr. Benneker mentioned, um, there's not a whole lot you can do about what happens when kids leave schools. So uh, that's very problematic. Uh, we have been presented as a board with uh, a, a number of times by the administration. Uh, Mr. Bolt and Mr. Kirk in particular have given us some uh, an understanding of what is being done to uh, prevent bullying in our school. And part of it, I think, is uh, consequences, certainly. But part of it that I think uh, the administration is onto something very, very significant and that is to get inside the head of the kid who's doing the bullying. Why are you, you know, not you know, to, to learn and understand what that child's uh, home life is like, what's going on inside his or her head? Uh, why are they doing the bullying? Does it make them make that kid feel better, you know, by putting somebody else down and, and then I feel better about myself? Um, I think our administration and our student services people are uh, excellent at that. And the more touches, if you will, they can have with these kids who are doing bullying uh, to help get to the root cause of it, uh, the better off they'll all be, and the better off our kids will be. And whether it's bullying and, a, and a shouting names in a hallway, or whether it's you know, using, using one of these things, um, the root cause can be, uh, uh, you know, we can get to the root cause, um, then it affects both kinds of Let's try to get to root causes as much as we can. All right, now time for our final long answer question. What is your perspective on a potential referendum for Arrowhead High School? If our school were to go to referendum, what considerations should be made to gain the support of our community? Mr. Thompson. Yeah, um, well, to set the table a little bit and to understand the situation, I think, uh, first of all, a lot of parents, may, or not community members, rather, uh, maybe don't understand what's going on simply because they don't have kids in the school anymore and probably 70 75 percent of the community is is there they don't have kids anymore in the school and so it's difficult to reach out to them 
but to be aware of what some of the issues are. We have security issues, okay? Why do we need a referendum? We have security issues. In this day and age, it's tragic to say, but there are people out there who would harm our kids. We all know that. And we have kids running, walking constantly back and forth between two buildings. It's not the ideal situation. We have an entryway uh, that, although a few years ago we put all brand new locks on all of the doors, that is just, it's still inadequate. It's, it's not enough. A referendum would help us with that. We have building maintenance issues, uh, a pool, um, rooftop units, HVACs, the roofs themselves. Uh, Mr. Farner took me into the South Gym just the last week on Friday and showed me something I was unaware of. He says, look up at the tiles up in the corner of the, of the South Gym. They're falling off and he, and he said, you know, keep, take a good whiff of the air. It smells musty, moldy. I think if I were trying to sell my house, I wouldn't be able to do it. The bu building inspector would not pass it. It's awful. Uh, it's unacceptable. Parking lots, um, all that sort of thing. Then we have competition from surrounding school districts. We have uh, KM and um, Germantown, Oconomowoc, and Pewaukee, and Sussex. They all are putting up marvelous facilities. This school has not passed a capital referendum, a capital referendum, since 1999. Okay, we've tried a couple times and they've, they've failed, but we've not passed one for 25 years. It's the um, community needs to know that. Okay, um, I don't know, I'm getting the red flag here, but um, we, we just need to uh, get that word out, and I think uh, one of the things we're doing is we're going to send out a postcard uh, very soon, pre-survey, we'll do a survey to try to educate the, the public on what we're gonna do, what we'd like to do, what the need is, uh, and then from the survey, we hope to get guidance from the community. What, what is most important to, to you? Do we want to go in this, that, or the other direction? And, as Daryl mentioned a moment ago, what's the tax tolerance? How much is this community willing to uh, support in terms of paying for the things that we need? And then once we know that information, uh, we need to engage every way possible, whether it's a PTO or a Rotary Club, other service organizations, Go to the feeder schools, do whatever we can to, to get people involved and get them educated. All right, thank you. Mr. Benneker. Um, I'm all for, you know, we need to do something here at the school. And fortunately, the state funding, you know, annual increases, we don't see that happening in the very near future whatsoever. So it is referendum is the solution. And, you know, this summer, um, we did go on a tour of about a handful of different schools just to see what was out there. And, you know, we did see, you know, there were some nicer learning environments, um, you know, both the classroom, also, you know, things, you know, athletically where we saw, you know, swimming pools and different things. Um, but for us to be, you know, a top-notch school, you know, we need to, like Craig said, you know, up Conomwalk, Kettle Moraine, you know, they're making some inroads on, you know, for new families coming out here, is Arrowhead still that, you know, place to be, or is these other ones gaining interest, you know, both for, you know, students, but also attracting the best employees as well. Um, we are, you know, one of the nice things when we were interviewing Conrad, he said, I'm six for six on referendums. I'm like, okay, well, let's, hopefully we can make you seven for seven. But and we are approaching this um, very methodically and, you know, being very data driven on this because, you know, for a referendum, whatever you ask for, it's, you're either getting that or zero. There's nothing in between, no matter if it's, you know, you're losing by one vote or 1,000 votes or 10,000 votes. So we are looking, you know, in terms of with our survey with school perceptions that's going out and I think mid to late April, um, we are going to see, because we need the community's backing on this, and we are going to find out what can we do to win, and um, you know, once we see that tax tolerance level, working with our administration board diligently, and it's like, okay, what can we do to hopefully get a lot, you know, some funding for our programs and buildings, because if we don't get that approval for the buildings, it's those programs that are going to suffer. 
you know, are we going to be able to offer, you know, multiple world languages? Just because maybe our budget is limited in other courses. So it is, um, you know, we need the community on this. And it is tough with the community because only 25%, I believe, have K through K through ch 12, K kindergarten through 12th grade children. The other 75% don't, so they don't have as much skin in the game as others. How to, can we persuade those people and tell them how this is a win for them as well? Thank you. All right, thank you both for those responses and all of your responses so far tonight. That concludes our long answer question portion. And now to finish up our forum, each candidate will now have three minutes to make a final statement. Mr. Benneker, you're first. All right, well again, Thank you for all the um, questioning. It was a pleasure. Um, hats off to you all on um, putting together a great program. Um, this was a great opportunity um, for you all and also for the community that was here tonight. Um, I do, you know, especially when I'm looking at all you kids, I'm looking at my old, my two daughters. This year is the first time they get to vote for president. Um, and it's like one of those things I tell them, you know, don't look at, it's hard, don't look at who has the most signs, who has, you know, things like that. Learn about your candidate, you know, learn about the candidates that you're voting for. Even if it's students, even if it's student council, learn about the people that are running, not just, oh, they're the most popular, I'm going to vote for them. Find out why they're running and how it benefits you. So I stress for you all to do your homework on you know before you're doing those votes maybe you're voting this um this april learn more about those candidates because it is one of those things that it is a privilege and it does impact you as a voter but also those people that can't vote that are you know your younger classmates too so thank you all right thank you mr benneker mr thompson your closing remarks thank you um i uh didn't quite get to this at the beginning of the uh, meeting because I uh, had something else to say, but I just wanted to give a little bit of um, biography about who I am and why I think I'm a good candidate um, uh, for this office. Um, I've lived in the Arrowhead District for 32 years. My wife of 42 years and I have four children, all of whom graduated from Arrowhead High School, and I'm very pleased and proud of the education they received here. I'm a husband, a dad, a homeowner, and a taxpayer. A good deal of my life experience has enabled me to be an effective board member. I have a bachelor's degree in science education from UW-Madison. Right out of UW-Madison, I taught science for three years in the Sun Prairie School System. Years ago, before we had kids, I also taught four levels of the German language at Arrowhead for a semester. I have real experience in the classroom with kids, including Arrowhead kids, and I understand education in a way that a non-educator cannot. I lived and worked abroad for three years doing extensive travel through much of uh, Eastern and Western Europe. At that time, I learned and acquired a fluency in the German language and have worked to maintain this skill. Experience abroad has given me a wider and more global perspective than most people have. I can appreciate views that differ from my own. It has been my privilege to serve on the Arrowhead Board for nearly 19 years alongside four superintendents. I served as a chairman of a Westbrook Church Board, now Ellenburg Church Lake Country, for five years. I've been a member of that church for 40 years. I've also served on the boards of two other small nonprofit organizations. I understand long-term commitment, the value of stability, ethical responsibility. I understand the proper role of a good board, board member, how to establish and build mutual trust and respect, and how to effectively collaborate with others toward common goals. I recently retired from a successful 39-year career as a financial consultant, assisting couples and individuals toward their retirement goals through effective planning and investing. I understand how to develop long-term relationships. I understand how to manage money as a fiduciary for others' benefit. I spent my career developing and maintaining long-term relationships and practicing prudent money management. Once again, I'll just say that I bring a conservative perspective that focuses on kids. 
The Arrowhead Board needs experience, ability, integrity, and an institutional knowledge. I bring those qualities to the board. And it's not just me saying so. I bring the endorsement of three past Arrowhead Board presidents, Joe LeBlanc, Kent Rice, and Bob Roche, as well as the endorsement of our recent superintendent, Laura Myra. I'll quote Laura, uh, Bob Roche. Quote, no one will serve the Arrowhead School Board better than Craig Thompson and I'm proud to be his friend. Former Superintendent Myra, Craig Thompson has my strongest endorsement as an Arrowhead School Board member, and I could encourage you to vote to re-elect him. I have, if you, want, if you want to elect someone who truly knows and loves Arrowhead High School, who knows this community, who knows how boards function, who knows and respects our administration and teaching staff, who is nonpartisan in his viewpoint, untethered from the money and political influence which has no place on our local school board. I ask for your vote. Students, some of you are eligible to vote for the first time. I hope you do. I ask for your vote. Parents and community members, I ask for your vote and that of five of your friends. <laughs> Thank you. This concludes our forum. Thank you to Mr. Benneker and Mr. Thompson for attending tonight and your time and participation. Thank you to our audience for helping make this forum a success. And please don't he hesitate to take a printout from the front of the room. I have actually no idea where it is. It's on the Over there. <laughs> the timekeeper's desk. Oh, there, right there. Um, showing the voting location for each, each district as well as the list of candidates. And of course, don't forget to vote on Tuesday, April 2nd from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m.